Thank you very much, um, John. Um, yeah, so thank you all for um, showing up and listening to me. Originally, it was going to be James um, doing this presentation. He had to be elsewhere, and um, I managed to say to him and to my boss that I had heard his presentations about a hundred times before, so um, that was the moment they volunteered me to do this presentation instead. I should learn from this from next time. Anyway, um, so the presentation that James was going to give was the um, based on the Tupuna seminar that he did on the 11th of December at MB. And we had to slightly adapt the slides a little bit to make it more appropriate for a webinar, but we're covering the same ground, so just bear with me. And um, before we start all the, all the details of it, I'd like to start with an example that some of you might be well familiar with, and I know one of us is very familiar with it, Denise Busel, who's in the audience. Um, but she worked on this example. So she might correct me later if I go wrong. However, um, it's about the stone and palm fruit growers in um, the Victoria's Goldburn Valley. And there's a large number of family-run orchards over there. And um, they mainly use for irrigation. And they have some issues with salinity and tree health problems. They, as you can imagine, they also have a large variation in the water use that they do, because they also have to order the water in advance. And there's a limited use of soil moisture monitoring and tools and systems. Um, so knowing that there's a bet going on, and it's main, mainly family run, and it works quite well for them. But obviously, um, the community around them has some concerns, because um, they have issues with rising water tables. And they have issues with salinity problems as well. So way back when, in 1996, or probably before that, they, uh, there was a project started that um, focused on micro-irrigation and soil moisture monitoring to get these tools and technologies adopted um, to improve the water use efficiency and to make sure that that adoption was really going to happen. Um, they had a big two-year extension program as part of this. And in that extension program, they had demonstration plots to show the benefits of using micro-irrigation and then using soil moisture monitoring. Um, they provided all sorts of technical information that would provide support with the decision-making process and um, show how to implement these new technologies that support systems and services, and um, training was given in irrigation management so that um, those doing the irrigation on, on those um, small family-run orchards would actually be capable of doing it the appropriate way. Now, before we continue, we have a little poll, and this is where John comes in again. So we're wondering, what percent of the growers do you think adopted actually soil mon moisture monitoring or uh, micro-irrigations? about three years after the extension program had finished, how many people, what percentage, did actually use these tools that they were presented with? So folks, you can see the poll in front of you. So now it's time. Just click the little radio button to the left. Don't be shy. Answers are anonymous, I'm glad to tell you. <laughs> and I can see that most people have now voted. So I'll close it off in three, two, one. And I'll share those results. So in case you can't see that, Kelly, it looks as though 44% uh, have said from 0 to 20, 40, and similar 44% said 20 to 40%. And one brave yeah, person, by the looks of it, said between 60 and 80%. That was very brave of that person. In the meanwhile, my screen has slightly changed. And I'm just trying to figure out if I can get you back on the big one. There we go. That should have done it. Um, so. I guess most of you were right. It was actually between zero and twenty percent of the of the um, farmers or growers in in the um, Victoria Valley um, that actually adopted these these tools. So there were hardly any changes or negligible changes in the practices. So that resulted that there was no improvement at all in water use efficiency, which was a shame. And also yeah. the wider salinity problems of the community um, were not addressed at all um, that the community came up with. So. I'll oh, tell you later. Me, Kelly, it, it, yes. it seems as well, I'm not seeing your screen. So can you is just pop not? back in and no, I think maybe the poll question mucked it up a bit, maybe. Oh, it might have. Let's see what we do about that. I wonder what it is. How do I think how do you think I should uh, get So the if you answer? well if I were you, I'd be clicking on the little blue flower and then come yep. back up and in the control panel just make sure you're Go show my application again with the little drop-down yep. arrow. 
All right. How is this? Is ah, this better? It. Yes, beautiful. So we're now seeing the, the cork bottle illustration. That's great. Yeah. So we come from the pool, as I explained. Um, only right. a very little amount of people actually um, took up these technologies, which resulted in no changes on farm and water in terms of water use efficiency, and the wider community concerns of with salinity uh, problems were not addressed either. Um, which means I'm now going to the body of this presentation. And first of all, I'll talk about the challenge that um, there is around getting technology adopted and, and uptake happening. Um, and then obviously there's some opportunities around that as well, otherwise we wouldn't be here in the first place talking about this topic, um, which I'll address then. And then how do we seize the opportunity in terms of the wider innovation system that we're in? So we're going from the challenge to something around a project level or innovation network level through the wider innovation system. Um, so what is the challenge? Obviously, and, and you'll all be familiar with this, there's a quite a big economic cost when it comes to poor technology uptake. And for the dairy sector, for example, that's about two and a half billion dollars per annum um, in unrealized exports. And for the sheep and meat sector, that's about a half a billion um, per annum. So that's quite a lot of money. On top of that, there's a considerable variability when it comes to the uptake of environmental practices. And that's not only bad for the environment, but it's also bad for a clean green image, which influence, again, exports and, and potentially the tourists coming in as well, like myself, most of the days. So addressing this poor technology uptake sounds like a good thing to do because we would gain a lot from it. However, it's not that easy. It's, it goes beyond uh, technology transfer alone. And as William Rolleston from Federated Farmers um, once said in 2012, um, the bottleneck is not the technology transfer. It's about how the science um, turns into innovation. Right. So a concrete example of a place where we're dealing with the challenge is the Wild Mercury Irrigation Scheme. And um, the aim for that scheme, obviously, is in the end to improve financial and environmental outcomes for the farmers in that scheme. And they want to do that by improving the water supply reli reliability um, as well as the water use efficiency on a similar note um, as the orchard disk that we are talking about earlier. And um, the way they are going about this, solving this um, you, or improving the water supply rel reliability and the water use efficiencies by using um, NEWAS weather forecasting data. And NEWAS has been providing specific farmers in the White McAreer Irrigation Scheme with um, weather forecasting data about their farm um, when it comes to the coming few days as well as seven days out and 15 days out. And NEWAS has also been kindly providing all sorts of soil moisture data and water used by crops etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so that farmers can make improved decisions about when to irrigate. So thinking of a water, ir big irrigation scheme and, and the use of weather forecasting data, we're doing another little poll, and I hope this time it goes right when it comes to my screen. Um, so besides, you know, and, and or maybe just water f weather forecast is enough, but what is the innovation that the Winemaker Irrigation Scheme is, actually needs? Is that that weather forecast and solely that weather forecast, or does it actually mean that farmers need to change their own farm management um, to use to utilize the water better and more efficient, and therefore increase their profits? Is it the water irrigation scheme installing a water storage thing, or is it um, the irrigation scheme developing a water trading scheme, or maybe is it all of the above? Your choice. Good idea. So, folks, you can see the poll there now. So, if you can just click on the answer, the uh, radio button next to the answer that you think might be right. So, I can see about two thirds of our audience has voted. So, come on, make up your mind. As I said before, <laughs> it is anonymous. And of course, at any time, you can type questions for Kelly in the bottom of your floating control panel, which um, will answer when we pause for questions. Okay, so folks, I can see everyone has now voted, which is great, so I will share that with everyone. So 10% of today's studio audience are saying uh, yes to the first one, 20% have indicated the second, and yes, 70% have gone for all of the above. So what's the right answer there, Kelly? Well, I would say that it would be all of the above, and I'll explain definitely later. Um, 
but without influencing the people. We have another poll thing, and as my screen again has changed, a magic wonder of um, of the technology on this end of the story. Can you still see my screen, John? Just to make sure. I can now. Yes. All right. So I have to uh. figure out. It keeps popping back, but that's all right. Um, there we go. So on top of that, we're just doing a brief other poll to keep you keep you going. Um, so you've just identified what you think is the necessary innovation that this irrigation scheme needs. So what then are the sources that provide that innovation? Is it the scientists? Is it the farmers? Or should it be an engineering firm that installs the water management infrastructure? Is it a profitable commercialization of the science? As we know that science already plays a big part in this project. And, um, or is it the effective combining of the both? Okay, folks, so you can see it there. I can see about two-thirds have voted. Just a few more people to go. I'll close that in three, two, and one. And sharing those results now. So mm -mm, it seems as though just about everyone has gone for the last option there, the effective combining. And by the looks, one person said the profitable commercialization of science. All right. Well, I kind of gave the answer away by the saying in the first poll that I thought it would be all of the above. But people are definitely entitled to their own thing. Again, my screen has changed, but I'm checking quickly. John, can you still see it? Um, let me just make sure that it's not my screen that I'm looking at, which it isn't. So um, I'm seeing the men and the bottle and the cork. All right. It keeps hopping back to that one. It's clearly lovely. Yeah, one. It How about now? One, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Now we see your table of approaches and descriptions. Perfect. All right. So, so some people identified earlier on saying that the newer scientists and, and the weather forecasting data was actually quite appropriate and potentially good enough to deal with the problems that the irrigation scheme has. And others said, well, no, we think that farmers probably should also change the practices on farm and um, um, utilize the water a bit better and make more profit in the end by it as well. And then others said, no, we need a whole whole range of innovations and and um, people involved to actually make that work. And all of these things are, are not wrong. Um, they're just different ways of doing. So if I started with the Victoria example as well, with the orchardists saying that that was clearly a, a case of technology transfer. We already had the science there, the soil moisture, monitor, soil moisture monitoring, as well as the, um, I forgot the word now. Anyway, the other tool, the, the micro-irrigation, and those were the, things that science already had identified that, that would work in that situation and they pushed it kind of along through the pipeline, through extension, onto the orchards and for use of farmers. And there's nothing nothing wrong with that. Um, and it, as, as it points out to this table as well, there's um, been significant productivity gains in Western agriculture by doing that sort of technology transfer. However, our problems after this um, have become a little bit more complex and we've moved on to adoption where we actually diagnosed what the farmers' needs and constraints were and took them into account, then identified what the right technology might be and put it through the pipeline again. Um, another way of doing it after this, when people realized it wasn't always solving the problems either, um, was that farmers said, no, you know what, we'll say what we need and, and we know what science is important for us and what it should look like and they became partners in, in crime if you like. Um, and they collaborated in the research and the extension. Um, so we call it adaptation. And again, has had many great successes and fits certain situations very well. However, the part that we're talking about today, and which is part of the primary innovation program as well, is around co-innovation, where we talk about real complex industry challenges that don't only involve farmers and researchers and extension, extension, but also look at the wider innovation system that we sit in, which includes markets and governments and the way we are structured and how organizations um, go about certain things. And it means that if we want to have solve certain problems, we need to co-develop innovations through these multi participant processes and partnerships. And so taking into account all of the relevant partners rather than just farmers, research and extension. And um, as I pointed out, that has emerged because we need to address the more complex environmental and animal welfare problems and um, I guess our nutrient management issues that we have in New Zealand 
at the moment and we're dealing with those are a very good example of complex problems where a co-innovation approach might well work. Um, so back to that example of the Victoria Orchard project, why did it fail? As I pointed out, there was clearly a technology transfer push. However, they had more wider concerns that didn't only focus on Orchard but were related to community concerns and the way community um, tackles things. Um, so they needed more of a co-innovation approach and thinking about off-orchard solutions as well rather than just micro-irrigation and soil moisture monitoring. Um, those things were that adopted, as I pointed out, it was between 0 and 20 percent. And the reasons for adoption were completely different than what people anticipated at the start of the project. Micro-irrigation was adopted because it would save the orchard is some time, and soil moisture monitoring was adopted to manage actually the tree figure. Um, so that, yeah, quite different reasons. And part of the reason why it wasn't really adopted was, for example, that um, in these large family farm orchards, the father, um, mostly retired, would do the furrow irrigation. And if we would, if they would adopt these um, other tools, they, he would do it himself out of out of a job, which is clearly not what he wanted. He wanted to stay involved um, with the orchard that he'd been living on for his entire life. And also the father was often the one owning the checkbook, um, which means investing in micro-irrigation and then doing himself out of job seemed even less appealing. Um, going back to, or going forward, so far, any questions or comments about this challenge? So I've talked about why we have a challenge and how much it costs us in terms of economics as well as environmental um, issues and um, what potential approaches might be to, to solve these more complex, complex industry challenges. Hmm. So folks, you can see on the slide there how easy it is to just type some questions in there. Uh, but Kelly, at this stage, it seems as though you must have been crystal clear with all your explanations because there are no questions. So folks, as Kelly proceeds to talk in a moment, keep typing in questions and we'll be stopping again um, in about 10 minutes and, and we'll take another question break then. So back to you, Kelly. Thank you. It's great to be crystal clear. I can't even pronounce the word right, so I doubt this, but we'll see how we go. Um, so after the challenge that I just pointed out, we'll go and move into the opportunity. So here at AgriSuit and in collaboration with a whole bunch of other research organizations and, um, and industry partners as well, we saw an opportunity when the 2012 uh, Biological Industries Investment Round came along from um, MB. And um, the priority for investment in that investment round was to improve the technology and knowledge uptake to change practices that will increase in um, the gains from New Zealand's biological resources. And the identified mechanism for addressing this priority was to research, um, do research into human behavioral factors and mechanisms for adoption of new practices from research and knowledge sharing among farmers, growers, and others. Um, so a proposal was put in by, by this variety of research organizations and industry um, good bodies, etc. And then, and MB was kind enough to grant us the money and allow us to have a stab at this. Um, so we have this impact statement and, and we, we say and we aim that we would have greater, more rapid impacts in addressing industry challenges if we get participants in the New Zealand primary industries to work together in innovation networks. And while doing that, we would um, try and research and identify practices and tools that allow joint learning and development of innovations. And um, besides researching and identifying them, we would also implement them in these innovation networks. And um, besides the innovation networks, we would look at the innovation system to see how we can enhance the performance of that innovation system. How does the innovation system allow these innovation networks to function optimally um, using the right practices and tools and um, supporting them in that way? So I'll firstly talk about these innovation networks. Um, there's another click in there. So the blue line around that, that's kind of the innovation system in which a lot of networks operate either on their own or together to make sure that innovations happen. Um, something about primary inno innovation program very briefly, because most of you will be very familiar with this. We started in 2012. Um, MB, as I said, funded us for $7.5 million 
scholars over those five years. We have a stack of researchers from about 11 organizations, and it's an ever-growing and moving feast because we find that some people have certain expertises in some areas, and we tend to include them because that's how we learn as well. And then we have a community of practice that mainly focuses on that innovation system level. It has about 40 uh, participants in it who will um, freely participate, or we don't pay them to participate. So there comes the in-kind form. And then on top of that, there is that provides us with some direct cash as well. Um, part of our, our contract with MB is also to implement the Vision Maturanga. And um, we have some core funding and um, two specific researchers of which one is on maternity leave at the moment, um, to implement and look at that vision Maturanga aspect of our program. So these innovation networks that I mentioned before, we have a variety, and you could see them as case studies, I guess. The gray ones are those that we that have already been finished and programs and projects that run in the past, of which we looked at with a co-innovation lens and said, what can we learn from these case studies about what worked really well in terms of co-innovation and enhancing um, innovative practices and what didn't work so well and how can we then implement them moving forward and those are the seven white bulbs that you see. Those are our ongoing innovation projects or case studies and they all form their own little network. Um, so we rank them at the start of this project whether they were more of a simple problem using a technology transfer approach would be sufficient or whether they were a highly complex problem um, such as nutrient management as I pointed out earlier on, and whether they needed a co-innovation approach. Now, obviously, people listening at the moment might well disagree with this page. Dairy heifer rearing is obviously, um, from experiences in the last few years, not been as simple as we pointed out here. Um, but this was our first um, guess I get, um, at it. Um, so moving forward to, to show you why, why we're taking this innovation co-innovation approach and, and testing it in real life, is this puzzle, and it goes back to um, the Y career irrigation scheme that I pointed, I talked to you about before. So first of all, we said that NIWA was um, helping with the development of these soil moisture monitoring information, as well as providing all the weather forecasts and the crop border use um, data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was one piece of the puzzle um, that that seemed relatively straightforward. And then it's obviously necessary for the farmer to identify opportunities to manage his water use and realize profits from improved water um, reliability as well. So the farmer had to identify, now I have this weather forecast information, what do I need to change in the way that I do things on farm to make use of that weather forecast information? And he got a little bit of help there um, from a rural advisor. So, that who would support the farmer in making these changes on farm to make sure that there was more efficient use of the water as well as more um, increased profitability um, by using this water more efficient. And um, that wasn't obviously the only thing. It wasn't only on-farm changes that, that are needed to make, uh, make this uh, project work, but it's also the off-farm stuff or the wider irrigation scheme in this case. The, the infrastructure of this irrigation scheme for storing and water, supplying water um, is something that they're dealing with at the moment and they're looking at if they can create some scheme level storage and um, they're also making a shift away from the open races that they had earlier on. Um, back to on-farm though, um, the irrigation equipment used on farms is something else that needs to be, potentially need to be changed and adapted in order to be more efficient in terms of water use. Um, and that comes with a little bit of training and technology. And irrigation in Z um, is the one that could well support farmers um, being more aware of the effective use of irrigation. And if that wasn't enough in terms of people in, involved and practices that need to be changed, then there's all sorts of rules for allocating water within the scheme as well. Um, currently, the farmers take a turn at the tap. But um, in the future, this will have to be more of a water trading scheme. So another layer of things to be dealing with in terms of using your water efficiency, or uh, increasing your water efficiency, I should say. Then the last two pieces of the puzzle have to deal with, do with the regional council. Obviously, the regional council have, has rules for water uptake from the Waimakariri um, River. And on top of that, they 
developing more and more rules when it comes to managing nutrient leaching. So this whole picture shows that you know you need to have all these different participants and players in the field working together, um, and therefore co-innovation seems to be a very good approach for that. So just in a, in a different format, I guess um, the co-development of innovations through multiple participant processes and partnerships. As I pointed out, we need all these different people, the rural advice, the farmer, um, irrigation and Z, as well as the regional council to work together um, to, to de make the water use more efficient. And um, that comes with all sorts of technical, social, and institutional changes. And in this innovation network, um, these people then appear up uh, along the supply chain. And it includes the government and potentially uh, also consumers. Um, they might prefer maybe in the future meat or milk from a farm that has been more efficient with its water use. Who knows what the future will look like. Another example, and I'll just keep going, and if there's any questions, John, I'm happy um, to take them now. Uh, no, there's still none, actually. All right. Well, I guess that's a positive. Um, so. So the, the Wyomick Irrigation Scheme, as an example of why co-innovation should be used, was already that approach, although not labeled as such, was already used in the Apple Futures project, which is one of our projects that look back, um, or where we put that co-innovation lens over it to understand it better. So in the Apple Futures program, um, it has a bit of background to it. In 2005, um, the New Zealand apples were exported to over 65 countries across the globe, and they only had a very small domestic market. Um, so export, export was main, their main thing. And in 2005 as well, the UK and Europe, who had 65% of New Zealand's global apple market, or the apples coming through New Zealand to them, they um, implemented new requirements. And they wanted ultra-low residue apples. On top of that, Asia, which was another major, or still is another major player in the global apple market, they um, up to their requirements when it came to sanitary and phytosanitary um, requirements so that they were more pest free. And that was two major implications for the, for the export market of apples. If they couldn't fulfill these requirements, where would all these apples go? Definitely not to our own small domestic market, or Australia for that matter. Um, so in 2009, or 2006 to 2009, they had a pilot program running called Pip safe, and that pilot program after 2009, or midway through actually, in 2007 was also um, incremental to the start of the Apple Futures program. So Apple Futures, and we'll fast forward, and we won't discuss all what happened between 2006 and 2010. But when the Apple Futures program finished in 2010, they managed to have a projection of low residue apples while also meeting the phytosanitary requirements um, of over 65 countries. So after four years of testing things and implementing things and figuring out how to create these ultra-low ultra residue um, apples, um, they actually managed to do that. And um, at that point in time, 63% of our national area um, with planted with apples was actually planted with um, low residue apples that or had a low residue um, approach and met their phytosanitary requirements as well. So it was a major achievement from going to um, two massive requirements that would potentially turn the whole export, ups export upside down to having 63% of our national planted area and being able to deliver to these requirements. So how did they then do it? First of all, they had participation of multiple stakeholders. They had everybody present who was needed to be involved to understand and agree on what the problem was. What do so, did those two requirements actually mean, not only for the growers, but also for the pack houses and for um, the industry good body called Tip for New Zealand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They had all these people involved, and they not only understood what the requirements were and what it meant for them, but also what what caused problems with meeting those requirements. And together they worked on. Um, workable solutions. So they had quite a strong national network having all of these um, various people involved and obviously um, government as well as researchers such as plant and food research played a big part in that as well. 
However, these people didn't come together just out of nowhere. Um, they obviously all knew about the new requirements, but it doesn't necessarily make them all work together. Um, although having a crisis sometimes really helps. Um, so there was a broker involved who was able to bring together these elements of the solution. And a broker in this case um, was a scientist from Plant and Food, as well as um, the industry good body for New Zealand, who provided that strong leadership um, sorted out the funding um, with also with the New Zealand Trade and Enterprise and they co coordinated the collective of exporters and um, they created that expectation that low residue apples were the way to go as well. So those two combined were able um, to to bring back bring together all these various people involved and um, translate the science into workable solutions uh, for growers as well as um, pack houses, etc. So once they got the people together and they were all thinking along the same lines, um, they actually built relationships. They built trusts up together. And that helpful was though that they had that PipSafe program already running before Apple Futures. So a start of building those relationships um, was already was already started. Um, so the scientists and Pipfruit New Zealand and the orchardist as well as all these others brought back together um, these collectives of exporters as well as discussion groups and they met with agrochemical companies and consultants and they built that trust and relationships and that was about valuing other, each other's knowledge. It's not to say that science has, is the only body of knowledge. Obviously these growers know their own orchards the best. So understanding what they were going through and how they would pick up new technologies was very important. And so they learned together from the successes and mistakes. On top of this, lesson number four, identifying a solution or bringing together people, then identifying what the problem is and understanding that together, then identifying solution as we've seen, um, is all great. But often what's left out is actually um, either the extension part of it, which is really well integrated in the Apple Futures program as well, but also that ongoing testing and development and especially resourcing that. It's often the tag on to a project and then science has moved on to the next project. So resourcing that post-development phase um, aims to undertake ongoing refinement and it supports learning by using and learning by doing and um, allows, allows science and others to respond to that learning as well. When orchardists came back and growers came back and said, look, um, I can't use this technology because it doesn't fit my farm or my grower practices. Um, it's too high or it doesn't work on the scale of, of my orchard that I have. And um, it allowed science and others to think of new solutions and work together and develop a better solution in the end. Um, so that was really well done in Apple Futures where they tested on uh, various orchard folks across the country. So it wasn't only region specific, it worked in various regions. And um, they had all sorts of processes for sharing the, the residue sampling data as well to, to be able to learn from that data and see what worked and what didn't. So in summary, around the opportunity, so I talked about the challenge and why we have this challenge of dealing with very complex problems. Um, in New Zealand and, and across the globe probably as well. And then we talked about the opportunity and that we're testing this co-innovation approach in real life using real life examples such as the WIMAC. And I, an, an example that we learned from was Apple Futures and um, what we got from Apple Futures were these four lessons. Participation of multiple stakeholders is very important. Somebody that actually can bring them together, um, these people as well as elements of the solution is very important. And then these solutions obviously emerge through the relationships that were built on trust. And once you have solutions, you also need to know if you can actually use them in real life. And therefore, resourcing the ongoing testing and development of solutions is very important. We're going to do another poll to keep you sharp and to stop me from talking for a minute. Um, so if you look at these four lessons that I just pointed out, then which one of those had you not considered before? Which one is new to you and did you never think of? That's right, folks. So you can hopefully see the poll in front of you now. Yes, yeah, so I see some people now responding, which is good. Good, good. 
we seem to have a very shy audience today, Kelly. Not not many questions at all coming in, but it's nice to see they're still with us and voting in the Good. polls, which is great. I see uh, just about everyone has finished there, so I'll close that off and share that with everyone. So it's interesting to see that uh, just over half are saying the second one there. So brokers bringing together elements of solution and just under a half for the final one, the resource ongoing testing and development. All right, that sounds really good. Um, which I, is not uh, uncommon. Obviously, the first one, a lot of people do think about this, and um, trust and relationships are quite critical. We all know that. But the second and the fourth one are less commonly known, so it's no surprise that people click on that. Um, I'm just doing another double check whether you can see my screen and whether it's gone <laughs> back to the man in the bottle. No, no we can't. It's um, hiding completely this time. All right. It must be shy as well. Must be contagious today. Maybe it's too cold. I know. I don't know. <laughs> so, are you able to see my screen now? <laughs> no. So, if I were you, no. clicking on the little blue flower, and then just I, I've sure even managed to lose them. Ah, oh, here we go. I think I've got it soft again, almost. How about it's now? It, it, it's, it's autumn coming into winter, isn't it? And everything wants to hide underground. Oh, yes, we do see it now, but we're seeing the questions, comments slide. Yes. You just need to make that, if you can make that full screen, then that'll be great. I will. I had some something popping up at me as well. Um, well, you think this would work, wouldn't you? There we go. <laughs> yes, I think we're ready to go again. Um, so regarding those, um, the poll that we just had in those four lessons, did anybody have any questions or about the YMA Career Irrigation Scheme or the Apple Futures Program for that matter? I think there's a cricket chirping that I can hear. So no, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, there are no questions or comments at this stage, but I'm hoping there will be some within the next few minutes. Right. <laughs> well, no questions doesn't, you know, it doesn't um, bother me either. It means I don't have to actually make up the answer that James would have given you to you otherwise, um, which is probably good. Um, let's move on then. So we talked about the challenge. We talked about what opportunities there are for implementing a co-innovation approach when it comes to on-the-ground projects or innovation networks, if you like. Um, and then I mentioned at the start of my presentation, I was also going to talk about this wider innovation system. Now, we have these innovation networks or these projects um, sitting there, but obviously there's a whole array of things that sit around them. And for an innovation system to work well and for innovations to happen on the ground, we need to have entrepreneurial activities, which people will all be familiar with what that is, and it involves that testing as well. Um, we need to develop knowledge, and it's not only knowledge by scientists, as I mentioned before, but it's also knowledge being developed by, by farmers, by processes, by industry good bodies. All people have some form of knowledge, and it's great when that knowledge gets developed and developed together, preferably. Um, then whatever knowledge is there also needs to be exchanged, and it's not a one-way process where science hands over to extension and they hand over to farmers or growers, but it's the other way around as well. Farmers, again, have a lot of knowledge and industry good bodies have a lot of knowledge and it's about sharing that knowledge and making sure everybody's aware of uh, what potential problems could be but what also what potential solutions could be and how they could fit together and work together. Another function is guidance of the search and it's more about who sets the priorities. What is our innovation agenda at the end of the day? What do we want to achieve? What are future problems that we need to deal with? And who gives guidance to solving that? And technologies never sit in isolation. There's always a market for them. Um, for example, with Apple Futures, that was the 100% pure um, New Zealand Apples brand when they went overseas. And I've seen them in the Netherlands. Um, there's apples that have a sticker on them that says 100% pure New Zealand Apples, which is really cool. Um, then there's resource mobilization. Obviously, all of these functions for knowledge development to happen, for um, innovation agendas to be set, for entrepreneurs, popping up and, and stirring up the, the world a little bit, it, it requires money basically and it requires time and effort from people as well as knowledge from people. All of that are certain resources that you need to be able to uh, 
um, that are necessary to support all the other functions. Then this creation of legitimacy, which tends to be a bit of a vague function um, of an innovation system. It basically has to do with new things. Doing completely new things means that you still have to bet all the old things and the old habits that people and processes and locations have. So um, in, this ca in the case of Apple Futures, it probably was Pipfruit New Zealand providing that legitimacy that low residue apples were the way to go. And although that was completely new and potentially out of the ordinary, um, it was important to push that um, so that you, we could still have the export of our apples going on. So they created the legitimacy for low residue apples and they kicked over their old regime, if you like, and provided an opportunity um, for low residue apples to um, be more important and effective in the market. So once we know that an innovation system has seven different functions, then these functions don't, don't happen out of the blue. You need actually people for that. And we call them actors in this case. And I heard James make the joke, it's not George Clooney. He might be involved, but um, um, it's actors in terms of different participants, different organizations, and different players, if you like, stakeholders, um, that all have a say in dealing with certain problems. And the way they interact, as I pointed out, you know, we need to have them building relationships and talking to each other to be able to solve problems in those innovation networks. And, um, and with interactions and with people, there certain rules of the game appear. Um, um, whether that's formal rules in terms of legislations and um, systems that the government has, as well as institutional rules internally within organizations, etc. And obviously there's an infrastructure that provides support um, for these interactions to happen, whether that's physical in infrastructure or more of a knowledge or financial infrastructure that all underpins these functions to happen so that we can make the system better in order to enhance innovation in these innovation networks. So in 2013, we interviewed all these community of practice members, um, which were about 30 at that point in time. And we asked them, well, when you think of, of innovation happening on the ground, then what's actually hampering those innovations? What's working well? What's not working so well? And um, the interviewees have identified a whole range of topics and opportunities, mainly. And I've picked out two of the opportunities here, and one of them is strengthening the um, industry and research interactions. And it means coordinating, for example, those innovation agendas. Um, because um, research goes off and potentially goes off and do their own thing about what they think is important, what they think the future problems might be. However, industry might have a completely different view on that. And they um, can provide leadership in their area to make sure that um, industry and research are more aligned in terms of what problems they're going to tackle and what they think um, future um, opportunities might be. Um, and then there's obviously connecting the user to the far formal R&D knowledge. As I pointed out in previous slide as well, farmers and industry good bodies and the government and all people hold some form of knowledge. Um, it might not be scientific knowledge, but that's that's fine in itself. And it's how do you connect that scientific knowledge with all the other forms of knowledge so that you come to um, a good solution together that works for everyone. So that's one of them. And, and then the other one is strengthening entrepreneurial activities, um, mainly focusing in this case on the ongoing testing and development in practice. So how would you actually um, solve a problem of lack of industry and research interactions or, or enhance the opportunity would be a, a more positive way of saying it. So it's getting these research organizations and the industry together, as I pointed out, to um, get more coordinated innovation agendas. And this needs strategic leadership to be able to do that. It also needs industry coordination. And the dairy sector is a very good example of that, where that's all quite well um, organized. However, forestry um, is more, more scattered and there's more organizations involved that have competing innovation agendas sometimes. So that industry coordination along the value chain um, is quite important as well. And then on the other side, obviously, is the funding um, to make coordinating, coordinated innovation agendas actually happen. And ways of achieving this strategic leadership 
um, having the industry coordination going on, as well as making sure that the funding aligns with that, um, could be a potential plat platforms of innovation agenda setting, where all these different parties come together and discuss what they see the future um, elements are that they need to focus on in the future priorities. The other one, an equally beautiful diagram, if you like, is the supporting businesses in this, uh, oh, I'll start at the top, sorry. Um, the entrepreneurial activities, if they, we want to strength, strengthen them, that's quite a challenge because we have a very large number of small and medium-sized enterprises in New Zealand. And they often don't have enough resources to actually undertake the extra, uh, entrepreneurial activities and specifically the ongoing testing and development in the field is something that often is not resourced. And then, which means it's critical to support these businesses in having that role of, of being the entrepreneur. The other element of it that we identified through the interviews is that the CRIs are potentially the ones to undertake an entrepreneurial role as well. However, currently they're not doing that because they see a risk in reducing the um, or in having revenue ge generation from um, commercialization pro pro processes and, um, and other entrepreneurial activities. So there, there are ways probably um, to, uh, to reduce that risk of this revenue generation um, so that CRIs can actually also take this role up and coordinate that better. And again, this could be potential projects where and innovation networks where CRIs come together with entrepreneurs and small and medium-sized enterprises to work on together on the commercialization phase or um, the implementation and uptake of new technologies. Um, and again, to be able to do that, as was well pointed out with the Piproot example, is that innovation brokers are um, people or organizations that could support such processes. I'm getting close to the end of it. Um, so in summary, all of this, what I talked about uh, I talked to in the past about an hour now um, is that we had this challenge. We need to uh, be more aware of the cost of technology, uh, poor technology uptake, and that technology transfer is not always the way to go. So we need to find ways of investing in R&D to support innovation so that we ultimately meet our economic and environmental goals. Knowing that that is the challenge that we have, then there's all sorts of opportunities when it comes to project level um, to go beyond the business as usual. So tech, not, not just technology transfer, but dealing with these complex problems in different ways. And a co-innovation approach might be one of those, which involves having those multiple stakeholders, making use of innovation brokers, um, knowing that solutions emerge from trust and relationships, so working together closely to identify um, what the problems are and what potential solutions could be, and then test those solutions and in the fields and make them real by learning by doing and learning by using. However, just on the ground work to implementing new approaches and to make innovation work doesn't always happen automatically because these innovation networks operate in a wider system whereby uh, rules and regulations as well as interactions between markets and overseas um, uh, countries sometimes hamper these innovations to do their own, to do the thing. So seizing this opportunity is about, for example, sustaining and improving research and industry interactions, as well as enhancing and supporting the entrepreneurial activities, so that we improve the innovation system functions and therefore um, enable innovation to happen better in these innovation networks. Right. On that note, I've come to the end of it, but maybe there's some questions. I'll go back to the summary. Oh, how exciting. Okay, so the first one is, uh, what would you consider to be the greatest limiting factor in, in all of this innovation network material that you've been talking about? What, what's holding it back the most? Well, the one that I hear most, and I'm not saying that it's holding back the most, but that's a, one that's very obvious and people can talk to quite easily. Um, um, knowing that it's a system and they're all interrelated, so pointing out one is quite hard, but um, the way our funding system operates is, is one that a lot of people tend to point out. Um, we need to collaborate on the one hand, but we're fighting for the same part of money on the other hand, and part of it is as well that research um, in CRIs and in universities, etc., we 
we do a project, we have money to do a project, but often when a project has ended or just before that, we're already on to the next thing, trying to identify the next pot of money to do the next project. And that means we, we sometimes drop the ball when it comes to the extension part of it or the ongoing research, testing and development of things um, because we just don't have the money anymore to do that. So um, it seems that money makes the world go round in this case, but that's one that's that a lot of people can understand and obviously see and have experienced as well. I'm not saying that that's the major one because I think they're all equally, they play a part because it's a system, but that would be an obvious one to point out. Okay, thanks Kelly. Another question for you. So you're talking about innovation brokers. How yes. do you think we can identify potential innovation brokers and then how do we support and encourage them? That's a very good question. I think some it's obviously, for some people, that's a natural set of skills. Um, innovation brokers tend to potentially be a bit more outgoing. They have an easy way of talking and communicating with people, and they have a wide network, and they've probably established it over years. Um, however, so, so you can train some people to be an innovation broker, but it's not an, a, a role that's, that's very obvious, and it might sit with multiple people as well within an organization. So identifying them, we haven't quite figured out the, the trick of the trade to be able to do that. Um, but for example, with the pit fruit and the apple futures example, that scientist that I mentioned before, and, and I know Nicola hopefully is still listening to me or Natasha, um, they know the scientist very well. And I'm sure they would be able to, to point out what, what skills he has that made him that broker, although he was not never labeled as a broker. Um, and then the acknowledgement part of it, that's a whole whole other thing. And I think a lot of organizations will, will struggle with that, valuing a person like that. Although they do that in terms of um, uh, personal value. You know, if you're a nice personality, people like you for it, but you won't be rewarded for it. So organizations um, have to think about how they um, support people that fulfill that role. Um, for example, within a CRI or a university, you get by the end of the year accounted on how many papers you've published, which is obviously very important for an industry, for a university or for a CRI. We do science, um, but in the end of the day, those that are able to translate the science very well to make it usable for those that need to use it, um, they don't get rewarded in the same way. Um, so those are I don't have the right answer to it. I know I find them both very critical. Having an innovation broker and the set of skills that come with it is, is incredibly hard to do that probably, as well as organizations and structures to reward these people for that role. Um, if somebody has a magic magic answer to that, I would really love to hear it too because um, um, it's something that we haven't quite figured out yet, but we're working on it. I'll get back to that later maybe. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. So yeah, so that is the end of the questions at the moment. So Kelly, on behalf of the audience, so, so like we've had about a dozen people join us today, uh, mm -hmm. which is delightful because none of us needed to catch a bus or drive for several hours or jump on an aeroplane to be able to hear this. So thank mm -hmm. you for being the brave one to kick off our Primary Innovation Monthly Webinar Series. Our thank you. Next one, our next one is going to be on the 4th of June where we're going to have the pleasure of Sam and Anik talking about, uh, giving us an overview about their PhDs. So that mm -hmm. one will be at the slightly earlier time, so that'll be at 12.10 New Zealand time, which gives people a chance to rush out of any meetings that uh, finish at 12 noon and to be able to log in for the webinar. So folks, it's been great having you along. Uh, thanks for being here. And again, Kelly, thank you for being the brave one in our midst today. So folks, I hope the rest of your days go well, uh, and I'll look forward to catching up with you next month at the next webinar. Thanks Thank you, everybody. James. Bye. My pleasure. Okay. See you, everybody.